New on the Creation Club is Shroud Manor, a secretive home once owned by Louis Trevisani, the foremost collector of silver shroud memorabilia and, by some accounts, a ruthless crime boss. Shroud Manor is a fully customizable home that adds a newly textured outfit, weapon, and over a dozen craftable items. Creation by Chesri. Shroud Manor is selling for 400 credits, but is it worth it? Let's find out. Upon arrival in the Commonwealth, we begin the quest, Shrouded Manor. Investigate the terminals at Police Precinct 8. We find Police Precinct 8 northeast of Diamond City. When we arrive, we have to kill a few rad roaches. And inside the precinct, we find a brand new terminal. Precinct 8 Terminal. Accessing secure network, connection lost. Here we find four entries. In the first, June 25th, 2077. From Lieutenant Mitchell to Sergeant Callahan, subject Trevisani. As you know, we've been trying to pin something on Louis Trevisani for a long time. He claims he's this wealthy purveyor of silver shroud collectibles, even going so far as to call his estate Shroud Manor. We've suspected for years it's a front, but we haven't been able to make anything stick. Then the other day, we got a lead from the detectives working that missing carpenter's case. You know the three workers who disappeared without a trace? We put their mugs all over the news, hoping someone would recognize them. Well, it turns out an eyewitness saw them walking into a house a few weeks before they vanished. Trevisani's house. Thing is, if we want to pin this on him, we're gonna need something a little more solid than a half-blind Irish lady walking her dogs. Cambridge PD wants to run an undercover op. We might be able to learn more about what happened to those carpenters if we had somebody on the inside. The problem is, half the cops in Cambridge Trevisani wants dead, and the other half are on his payroll. If we're gonna do this, we need somebody outside the department. Somebody clean. In the next one, July 1st, 2077, from Lieutenant Mitchell to Sergeant Callahan, subject Officer Izola. I looked over your recommendations. She is a little green, but I think Officer Rizzola is the right choice. Graduated top of her class, grew up in a tough neighborhood. For her to make it out of that godforsaken hellhole means she's got bigger balls than anyone on the force. Take her off the beat and set up a meeting with her tomorrow. We don't want anyone seeing her in uniform. 14 days later, July 15th, 2077. From Lieutenant Mitchell to Sergeant Callahan again. Subject, cover story. There's a bit of a complication. With the Carpenter investigation all over the news, Trevisani's turned completely paranoid, which means he's not taking on any new crew members. I'm intrigued, though, by your earlier suggestion that Officer Izola play to the man's baser instincts, which might work if we make it seem like the whole relationship was his idea. One of the directors at Hubris owes me a favor. Let's hold an open audition for extras and invite Trevisani over for a look-see. If he's really such a big fan of the show, he'll be happy to get a peek behind the curtain. And in the final one, a month later, August 14th, 2077, from Lieutenant Mitchell to Sergeant Callahan again. Subject, she's in. My man at Hubris says the whole fake audition worked like a charm. It's gonna take some time to reel him in, but at least he took the bait. The aspiring actress bit will help us with the meets, too. We set her up with a job at the Warren Theater on Saturday nights, doing plays so boring there isn't a chance in hell Trevisani will show up, especially because he thinks she's an idiot, watching her stumble through the classics would just embarrass him. When the show's over, head on over to the dressing room. It's a fancy joint, but you don't want to stand out, so maybe wear that cheap tan suit you love so much. Use the key I sent you to open the drawer in the corner, where the actors powder their face and leave their cigarettes. As for your girl, she's got guts. Just the thought of cozying up to that greasy bastard makes me want to vomit, but I hear she's played the whole thing cool. Even had this cute little shtick about waiting until marriage, and it only made him more obsessed. She's a little naive, though, if she thinks a man like that is going to wait forever. But that's not our concern. Our job is to get dirt on Trevisani, whatever it takes. If it means throwing a rookie cop to the wolves, so be it. So these cops roped in a new recruit to pose as Trevisani's girlfriend, and they're perfectly willing to sacrifice her to get their man. Looks like they got Izola a job at the nearby Warren Theater. That's where she would go to drop off messages for the cops. And inside the desk, we find the Warren Theater key. The Warren Theater is an unmarked location, which I covered in a video about unmarked locations that you can watch here. It's not far from here. We arrive a short run later. 
Heading inside, we can walk through the lobby and take the elevator up to the theater floor. We triggered the surprise that was waiting for us on the stage long ago, but we find something new. The dresser on the far corner of the stage is locked, but we can unlock it with the Warren Theater key. Inside, we find Officer Izola's note, a red dress, a key to Shroud Manor, and a silver dress. But as soon as we loot the items in this dresser, now you're mine. Trigger men? What are trigger men doing here? We have no beef with them, unless they're somehow connected, but wait, it's 2287. We're reading events that happened in 2077, over 200 years ago. Why would trigger men be attacking us now? On one of the bodies, we find the trigger man's note, as well as the Shroud Manor terminal password. Inspecting both notes in our inventory, we'll start with Officer Izola's note. I think one of Trevisani's goons followed me here, so I'm going to keep this short. I'll try and come back next week, but if you don't hear from me then, I've left a spare key to the manor in this dresser. Other than that, I've got nothing else to report. I found a passage behind a bookcase that leads to Suiza's office, but the vault's locked. Whatever's inside has got to have what you're looking for. Coupled with the stuff he's recorded on his holotapes, you should have more than enough to put him away. I know Lieutenant Mitchell wants something more tangible before you move in, but you've got to pull me out now. With everything that's gone down, Trevisani's getting more and more agitated, and at some point, he's going to call me on my bullcrap. So Azola thought she had done everything she could. She wanted them to pull her out, but they had no intention to. Next, we can read the Trigger Man note. Every week, we stop by the theater to see if anyone will show up. It's a waste of time. Ain't no one but us left. But if we find this capo, maybe it'll get the boss to leave the vault. Staring at those screens all day has become an obsession. You're kidding me. This Trevisani mob boss is still alive? What, did he become a ghoul? And he's working with the trigger men? What, did he hire them as bodyguards? The silver dress is a brand new item. It has zero ballistic energy or radiation resist, but it grants plus two to charisma. It appears to be a retexture of the red dress, the one that Magnolia wears, only this one is silver. It's a good looking dress and it makes sense why Trevisani would have Officer Izola wear it. If he is a big silver shroud fan, of course he'd put her in a silver dress. And if we take it to an armor workbench, we find that it does allow ballistic weave. So we could turn this into an armored outfit, a welcome touch. But now that we have the key to this Shroud Manor, let's track it down to see if we can find this boss. Shroud Manor is in Cambridge, right next to the Cambridge Police Station. This fact makes it a dangerous location for anyone who has made enemies with the Brotherhood of Steel. Just by walking up to the door, we can catch the attention of Brotherhood of Steel soldiers at the nearby police station and from nearby raiders. So this really isn't a pretty dangerous spot. When we're ready, we can head inside. Now in Izola's note, she said that there was a secret passage behind a bookshelf. And as soon as we arrive, our quest marker points us to the bookcase right in front of us, tagging it. Sure enough, it slides open. Here we find a door, which brings us downstairs to a basement. Opening the door to the basement... What? Time to death! More trigger men? We arrive in a large room filled with shipping canisters. There's a staircase leading up, but we see our quest marker on the other side of a window. Opening a door, we can open the door to an office to the right. Before accessing the wall-mounted terminal, we can read the contents of the nearby desktop terminal. Here we find five entries, going all the way back to May 23rd, 2077. From Alfonso Vicini to Tony Suiza, subject, The Boss. It's been a week now since the attempt on the boss, and everyone's still nervous about how the hell someone just walked in here and sprayed the joint with bullets. 
We were lucky that the boss only took a slug in the arm. We could have lost him. It's got to be the Michelli gang behind it. Old man Michelli still blames the boss for the cops blowing away his son on that bank job that he and the boss pulled. The boss is still as jumpy as hell, pulled his gun and started shooting up the room when someone slammed a door. He's talking about making some bolt holes in the house, places where he can make a quick exit to when things go to hell. He sent Marco out to find someone to do the building work. Just stay on your toes. There could be another attempt. So Trevisani had enemies. Sounds like a good enough reason to install all of these hidden passages. In the next one, September 22nd, 2077, from Alfonso Vicini to Tony Susia, Raid... The cops are here and they're searching the joint, so stay put down there. The boys and I made it into the attic just in time, and the boss made it into his office with Vini and Marco. That was real smart of the boss to make these secret passages. He says we all stay put. Don't make any noise, and we should use the terminals to talk to each other. Those dumb cops don't have a clue that we're all standing here inside the walls. I heard him talking about looking for some kind of evidence that those carpenters were here. I was trying to listen for more when Jimmy started coughing, the dumb palooka. Almost gave the game away to the coppers standing nearby. I had to put a gun to his head to shut him up. Heads are gonna roll for this. Who the hell tipped the cops off about the carpenters? So Trevisani really was responsible for the disappearing carpenters. But why would they make carpenters disappear? In the next one, September 26th, 2077, from Alfonso Vicini to Tony Susia, subject Candy. The boss is still mad as hell. He wants to know who tipped off the police about the carpenters. Says he's sure that it's one of the boys and that he's going to find out the rat who did it. I don't think it was one of us. I've been watching the boss's new squeeze candy since she came on the scene, and something about that broad doesn't add up. She plays the dumb dame, but I don't think she's as dumb as she looks. Maybe she tipped off the police. Hell, maybe she's even a cop herself. But I ain't stupid enough to tell the boss what I think. He's dizzy for the dame, and with gams like that, who can blame him? But no broad is worth the risk, so I'll be watching every move. So the boss's goons were onto Officer Isola but did they ever tell Trevisani? In the next one, September 16th, 2077, from Alfonso Vicini to Tony Susia, subject Candy's show. Tonight, Candy went to one of her gigs over at the Warren. Since the boss has no taste for it, I decided to follow her to take in a show. Figured it was good for a laugh, if nothing else. Funny thing is, she never went up on stage. The dame just stayed in the back, powdering her face. Listen to me, Tony. You know I've got a good read on crap like this, and something wasn't right about the whole thing. And in the final one, October 20th, 2077, three days before the bombs dropped. From Alfonso Vincini to Tony Susia, subject, a doggone week? Things are heating up over those missing carpenters. It's now all over the news that the cops sent divers into the river and found the van with the bodies. There's no way that they could have known to look there unless one of our own snitched. I know he ain't here now, but the boss told me to tell you to put the screws on those men you got working down there. Tell them straight out that if they don't keep their traps shut, their families will be bumped off. Maybe give them some hush money as further security. Speaking of which, is it true the boss went into the vault with Candy to propose? And they ain't coming out for a week? This ain't the time or the place for a doggone wedding, let alone a honeymoon. But at least if she's locked in there, she can't do any more harm. Honestly, we've had nothing but trouble since that broad arrived. So Candy and Trevisani locked themselves in the vault three days before the bombs dropped for a week-long honeymoon. Did they ever emerge? Using the terminal password we found on the body of one of the triggermen we killed back at Warren Theater, we can unlock the nearby wall-mounted terminal. Here we find an option to unlock the nearby security door, which is none other than this large vault door. Activating it. And it swings open. And whoa, vault indeed. We find shelves piled high with pre-war money and gold bars. There's more pre-war money in the duffel bags, documents, and cardboard boxes at the bottom, and a couple of ammo canisters. There's even more pre-war money in the wall safes. To the right, there's a door. Inside, we find a bank of monitors. So someone has been sitting here watching the outside, but for how long? Interesting that they have an institute chair here. Wonder how they got their hands on that before the war. We see a silver shroud poster on the wall. 
Man, this Trevisani really had it bad. And expecting the monitors, we see that these are the same camera angles that the Institute's watchers are using. For more information on that, you can watch my video on the watchers by clicking here. I don't think there's a connection. I think they just reused assets. They wanted a bank of monitors, and the Institute's were the only ones that they had. But from here, we find another door to the north. This leads to a private bedroom. We can turn off the radio to avoid demonetization. There's a bed in the corner, a submachine gun on a nearby dresser, some black vest and slacks on the bed, and a unique pistol lying on the kitchen counter. This is a sharpshooter's silver sidearm pistol. It's basically a reskinned deliverer. It uses 10 millimeter ammunition and has all the same mods as the deliverer, but it comes with a unique texture on the grip, a silver and black floral motif. It doesn't have any legendary effects, but we can modify it at a weapons workbench to be a pretty impressive silenced weapon, just like the deliverer. In the corner on a table between two black couches is a silver wedding ring right next to Candy's holotape. We know that Candy was Officer Izola. If she has a holotape here, that means she was locked in here with Trevisani. Let's find out what she has to say. Inside, we find seven entries, going all the way back to August 21st, 2077. When I was a kid, I used to pretend that I was the Silver Shroud. I had a hat, a squirt gun that I called the Silver Sidearm, and a jacket from my uncle's closet that was three sizes too big. I'd go out into the schoolyard and tell the bullies their time was up, but it never quite worked out the way I wanted to. Life rarely does. I guess the same could be said for my career as police. I wanted to work myself up to detective, solving murders and putting the bad guys behind bars. Yet here I am, on the other side, working with the very men I swore to put away. On top of that, there's the mansion. Living here, surrounded by all this imagery, it feels surreal. That kid in the oversized jacket would have been thrilled to live in this house. The reality, of course, couldn't be more different. But however I got here, I'm still a cop and I've got a job to do. I've managed to get Trevisani to start using a holotape. My hope is that the fat jerk will make my job easier by incriminating himself. Well, hopefully, but Candy just incriminated herself. Writing a diary on a personal holotape inside a gangster's mansion, admitting that she's an undercover cop. I guess she's just lucky Trevisani never got his hands on this. Or did he? In the next one, September 13th, 2077. I've been trying for weeks to get Trevisani to open up about the business, but he's been reluctant to mention what happened to the carpenter crew. On the other hand, it makes for a good excuse for why I won't sleep with him. If he won't budge, then neither will I. Of course, if he does budge, I might have a problem, but that's why God invented handcuffs. I might have more luck snooping around. I caught one of his goons blabbing to his friend about taking someone for a drive down river. It's a long shot, but it might be worth mentioning to the Sarge next time I see him. So the leak about the location of the Carpenter's bodies did come from Candy. In the next one, October 17th, 2077, I left a note at the Warren and let my frustrations be known. I've given them the location of the bodies, information on Trevisani's operation, and the existence of his secret vault. But Lieutenant Mitchell's still frustrated that the initial raid turned up nothing, and now he won't so much as scratch his balls unless I have Trevisani confessing to the doggone Lindbergh kidnapping. Compared to busting jaywalkers and pushing papers, going undercover seemed like a big break, but this is way beyond what I signed up for. I'm starting to question whether the department truly has my back. Either way, I'm gonna have to do something risky if I want out. So Candy figured out that the sergeant threw her to the wolves, abandoning her here. Did she ever get herself out of this? In the next one, October 19th, 2077, Trevisani is dead. The irony is he was willing to tell me everything, but only after everything else. When I asked him flat out if he murdered the carpenters, he got rough. I got rougher. I'm not sure how I'm gonna get out of this. There's a guard at the door at all times, so I can't get out but I can't stay in either. Because at some point, I'm gonna run out of food or his men are gonna get suspicious. So she killed Trevisani when Trevisani tried to consummate their relationship. But all that did was get her stuck here. In the next one, October 31st, 2077, eight days after the nuclear apocalypse, it's hard to process what just happened last week. Even though it's on the monitors, I still can't believe it's real. 
Inside the house, everyone's dropping like flies. Travisani's gang, the help, everybody. Bless those carpenters. I don't know what materials they use to build these walls, but somehow it's keeping me alive. Pretty soon, I'll be the only one left, which means I finally have a way out. But into what world, I don't even know. And the way my skin's looking, I'm not sure I'll live long enough to see it. So the vault protected her from the majority of the radiation, but not enough. She began to turn into a ghoul, but at least she didn't die. How long did she live? In the next one, August 15th, 07. But is that 2107 or 2207? We find out soon, it's been 30 years since I've picked up this holotape. Not sure how much space is even left on this thing. First thing I did when I got out was head back to the station, dead or not. I was going to check in the evidence on Trevisani, close the case, and maybe have a drink with Sergeant Callahan's corpse. I showed up in full uniform, with a badge and a baton and everything, but no one was there. Then I opened up the sergeant's terminal. Big mistake. It turns out they didn't even give a crap about my safety. They left me in this house of horrors to get raped, killed, and who knows what. I guess I should be thanking them. If they pulled me out, I would have been blown to bits along with the rest of the world. But it still doesn't make it right. So I tossed my baton in a box and burned my uniform. From that day on, I was done being police. In the next one, August 23rd, 2177. A hundred years since the bombs dropped, and I'm still alive. In fact, I've turned into quite the successful mob boss. Living in this house, it was only natural to use the resources it provided. I took the connections Trevisani built through his fake comic book business and found some were still alive and kicking. Together, we rebuilt the organization the same way he did, from small-time protection rackets to smuggling chems and deals with the mayor. Of course, in that world I'm Candy, the old boss's main squeeze. Not that it's a lie, I've spent more time as Trevisani's so-called mistress of mystery than I ever did as a cop. But these days, I'm starting to feel nostalgic. If I'm still alive, I'm beginning to wonder who else survived. Case in point, the other day on the monitors, I saw someone that looked like Sergeant Callahan. The boys might think I'm crazy, but he had on that same cheap tan suit he always wore with a ticket in his breast pocket. It was for the Warren Theater. Oh, what, she got a close-up of the text Warren Theater on a ticket in a breast pocket from those monitors? Wow. Enhance... After the war, the thing you tell survivors is to head back to old haunts. If you met your friends at a bar on Saturdays, go back to that same bar and see if your pals show up. If Callahan is out there, maybe he stops by Warren every now and then for a drink. Maybe that ticket is his way of identifying himself to an old friend. If only he knew. A century is a long time to hold a grudge, but time was never a concern for him. Why should it be for me? So that's why the Triggermen attacked us at Warren Theater. They weren't working for Travis Sani. They were working for Candy. Candy, who rebuilt his crime empire after the apocalypse. She thought she saw Sergeant Callahan on one of the monitors, assumed he'd head back to the Warren Theater, and began sending Triggerman patrols to the Warren Theater on a regular basis in case he showed up. But instead, they found us. But if Candy is still alive, where is she? On the counter, we can loot the silver wedding ring. Candy's not wearing it. Looks like she didn't agree to Trevisani's proposal. But of course, why would she? She killed him. But we shouldn't loot this ring at this point, for reasons I'll explain in a little bit. To finish exploring this room, we can move to the kitchen. There's still food and drink in the fridge, almost as if someone still lives here. A cooler on top of the fridge and a pile of pre-war boxed goods on the countertop. We see some wonderful new posters on the wall. There's a Mistress of Mystery one here, and another Silver Shroud one. And turning to the east, we see a bathroom. Opening it. Huh? Yeah. Let's do this. <laughs> it was Candy, standing right here the entire time we were reading her holotape. Oh, wow. And with that, we kill the crime boss. Looks like we've cleared out this manor's owner. Time to inspect our new digs. Heading out of the bedroom, we find a bathroom to the west. And back out into this warehouse area, we can move to the northeast to find the workshop. Activating it completes the quest Shrouded Manor and turns this manor into our own personal player home. We can now decorate it to our heart's desire. 
The home comes equipped with plenty of power. There's a fuse box on the wall generating 100 power. But before we get to decorating, we can finish exploring. We can head up the staircase to the west to explore this upper level. Here we find an office with a bunch of desks and terminals. In the first one, we find one entry, September 6th, 2077, from Mark Richards to Jake Anzel. When I was headhunted, I thought that it was a really good thing, but now I think that maybe I was blinded by the money offered. Yes, the money is good, really good, twice what I was earning for designing posters for the war effort, but what we are doing here, designing counterfeit merchandise for the Silver Shroud brand, is completely illegal. When Mr. Suiza offered me the job, he didn't mention anything about this. He only said that I would be designing new posters for his merchandise, and that I would need to keep the work I'm doing a secret. Well, secrecy is normal in our line of work. We don't want other companies stealing our designs, so I didn't think anything of it. But now I'm not sure that is what Mr. Suiza meant. Also, when Mr. Suiza bent forward to talk, his jacket fell open, and I swear that he was wearing a shoulder holster with a gun. Who carries a gun to work? I am not sure about this anymore. Maybe I should talk to Mr. Suiza and tell him that I'm not comfortable breaking the law, and then try to get my old job back. Oh, so this is how Trevisani and his thugs were making money. They were creating knockoff branded Hubris Comics Silver Shroud merchandise. Is this how he made his fortune? Did they engage in other organized crime or was this about it? On the opposite end of the room, we find another desk with an entry on the same day, September 6th, 2077. From Jake Ansel to Mark Richards. Okay, so these were two fellow employees who sent messages to each other over the manor's intranet. Look, you've only been here for a week, so I'm going to clue you in to how things work around here. You keep your head down, don't think, and don't ask questions. If you see or hear anything unusual, you didn't. Understand? You just do your job, get paid, and buy your wife and kids something real nice for Christmas. That way you stay out of trouble and the boss is happy. One more thing, when you go into the office downstairs, never, ever look at the vault. It makes them really nervous if any of us pay too much attention to the vault. Other than that, welcome. Heading out and going downstairs, we can retrace our steps to explore the rest of this manor. Back in the entry room, we find a number of paths forward, two doors to the east, a staircase up to the north, and a door to the west next to a big silver shroud poster. We'll start by going to the west. Here we find a nice little parlor with beautiful silver shroud themed furniture. The couches and chairs are gray, and we find a reskinned lamp here as well. The lamp is gray with musical notes on it. Here we find another bookcase passageway, but it's already opened. Heading inside, we find a thin hallway leading to a door, which opens up into an office. Oh, okay, so that's why it was open. Preston got here ahead of me. This must be Trevisani's office. We find his terminal on the desk. Inside, we find two sections in the first messages. June 12th, 2077, from R. Jameson and Sons Carpentry to L. Trevisani. Subject, work. Mr. Trevisani, we're just finishing up the last areas that need touching up and will have completed the work by the end of tomorrow. As you requested, I have kept no official records of the work that we have completed for you, and only my two sons and I have any knowledge of the new passages and secret doors. You can rely on us to be discreet. While finishing the work, we noticed that the floor is sagging a little in the back right corner of the billiard room. You may want to think about having the floor joists in that area checked out to see if they have rotted. That is something that we can do for you and replace any as needed for a very reasonable price. It has been a real pleasure working on your old Georgian-style home, Mr. Trevisani. It's a real beautiful house. R. Jameson. So that's why Trevisani had the carpenters killed. They built all of his secret passages. They were the only ones outside of his gang who knew about them, and he bumped them off to prevent anyone from finding out. But a father and his two sons? In the next one, on June 13th, the next day, 2077, from M to L. Trevisani. The job is done, boss. They won't be squealing to the fuzz or anyone. We checked their office and there's no record of them doing any work for you. Turns out the old man was a widower and his sons were not hitched, so there was no family for us to silence. M. M must stand for Marco. That was the name of the guy Travisani sent to go find the carpenters to begin with. But this was written the day after they got the note from the carpenters saying that they had a sagging floor in the billiard room. Did they ever fix that? Those carpenters couldn't have done it. They were killed the very next day. If they hired a new crew to fix the floor, did they kill them too? 
backing out of messages, we can explore personal logs. In the first September 2nd, 2077, it's always been my policy not to use tapes or terminals. It's fine for them other Goombas, but I don't need to record every stray fart that comes out of my head. But that all changed when I met Candy, my very own mistress of mystery. She says I got way too much genius to not write my ideas down. I know she ain't the sharpest tool in the shed, but it ain't like she's wrong neither. I built this entire organization from the ground up, using the Silver Shroud as a cover for our operation? That was my idea. Protection, smuggling, chems, whatever you need, all you gotta do is speak to the Shroud. I got my fingers dipped in every pocket in town, and the mayor and the city council don't have a clue. They think I collect comic books. Fact is, Candy's right. I'm a blasted genius. And after what happened with the Michelli gang, I had been thinking about what I'm gonna leave behind. My legacy, so to speak. Maybe putting down a thought or two ain't such a bad idea. So he fell for it. Hook, line, and sinker. Let's see how far he went to incriminate himself. In the next one, September 26th, 2077, I've been pissed off for about two weeks straight dealing with this flamboyant carpenter bull honky. The boys think it might be a rat. Well, if we've got a rat in our midst, then I want that buck-toothed, cheese-eaten snitch skinned alive. I want this rat beaten so fabulously hard that every snickering rat in this city rethinks their occupation. I want rats on so many ventilators, the splendid hospitals run out of electricity. I want the homeless chaps eating out of mouse traps complaining about a good-for-nothing rat shortage. I want so many dead blessed rats they do a never-ending Save the Rats telethon because they're now an endangered don't-you-know species. I want the jolly governor to call a state of serious emergency because Louis stand-up guy Trevisani killed every stinking rat-faced feller who ever lived. Bummer. I gotta calm down. Candy says the stress ain't good for me. She's right about this whole holotape thing, though. Letting it out helps. <clears throat> In the next one, October 17th, 2077, I'm gonna ask Candy to marry me. I've got the ring picked out. Silver, just like the shroud. She might not get it, bless her dumb little heart, but when I tell her what it means, she'll flip. Now, I know this ain't the best time with all the heat, but I don't give a crap. I can invite the chief of wouldn't you know what police. No, the whole jolly jumpin' police department to the wedding if I wanted to, because at the end of the day, I run this city. After reading this terminal entry, we get a miscellaneous quest to find the wedding ring. The problem is that if we've already picked up the wedding ring, the quest doesn't register it. And once we have this quest, we discover that we can't drop the ring because it's a quest item. So there's no way to complete this quest if we loot the ring before reading the terminal. In order to complete it, I had to reload a save to before the point when I looted the ring. That way I was able to read this terminal first, then go downstairs and loot the ring to complete it. And in the final one, October 18th, 2077. I floated the idea of getting married to Candy, but the dame wasn't having it. She says she knows the whole Silver Shroud business is bullcrap. So if I want to prove my love to her, I've got to stop keeping secrets and let her in on what I'm really up to. The boys might not like it, but she's right. I'm thinking of bringing her down to the vault and telling her everything before taking a knee. We don't even need a priest or a judge. They both work for me. Why the hell do I need them? All I need is for her to say yes, and she's gonna say yes, at least when I'm done explaining it to her. I'm gonna romance this dame so hard, we'll be consummating the marriage halfway through the vows. I told Tony, don't even bother opening the vault up for a week. I don't want to hear nothing about no doggone carpenters while me and my girl are on our honeymoon. Yikes, what a creep. Locking himself in a vault with his missus, she's gonna say yes, I'll make sure of it. Good thing Candy stopped him before he could. Behind the desk, we find a wall safe with pre-war money inside, and that's it for Travis Sonny's office. We find a door to the north, but when we open it, we see the back of a bookshelf. Okay, so two secret ways in. We can push the door open, and it leads to a bit of a smoking parlor. More bookshelves to the right and left, and a bunch of chairs around a table. We see a staircase going up, and a door to the east, before we go east, let's go up these stairs, see what's at the top. We arrive in a loft area, more bookshelves and tables and chairs, and a door that leads to a balcony, connecting to several rooms. Behind us leads to a bathroom. Heading south to the end of the balcony, we find another bookcase. 
leading to another staircase. Heading inside and going upstairs, we arrive at another one of their hideouts. This is where Trevisani and his men were waiting while the police were searching the place. We see a shelf filled with chems so his goons could entertain themselves while they were waiting for the cops to leave. There's a fuse box against the wall, but it appears to be non-functional. I didn't find any fuses in this house, and there was no other way to interact with it. But now that we own the manor, everything here can be scrapped, including the fuse box. We find a shelf filled with all sorts of stuff, bullets, ballistic weave, and plenty of weapons, and even more gangster-themed stuff stacked on boxes and crates. But this attic area is a dead end, so heading downstairs, we can go back through the bookcase to the balcony. Turning right, we can open two double doors, which brings us to a large room. We see more new reskinned furniture that comes with this creation, some glossy white chairs, and we find yet another bookcase door against the wall to the north. Opening it up... leads to another staircase. Heading upstairs, we find the thugs' firing range, where they did target practice. Ammunition, chems on boxes on the ground, hats and guns stacked on boxes all over the place. But this likewise is a dead end. Heading downstairs, we find a ladder leading to the rooftop. The rooftop has a great overview of Cambridge. We find some still-lit lights strung out, a couple of chairs and a lantern, a cooler with some food, and from here we have a wonderful vantage point of the Cambridge Police Station. It's a great place to snipe off all the nearby raiders and Brotherhood of Steel. There's a crumbling roof nearby, which we can use to climb down if we want, or we can head back through the hatch to continue exploring. Back downstairs, we can open a door to the north, which leads to another bookcase. This leads to the billiard room. Now, we read about the floor sagging in this room on Trevisani's terminal, but I inspected it thoroughly and I didn't find any evidence of this sagging, any trap door, nothing really interesting in this room at all. We see two doors. Opening the door to the west, this is a closet with all sorts of containers that we can loot, and then going out the door to the south leads us back out to the balcony. Heading back into the room on the other side of the double doors, we can turn west, and this brings us to the master bedroom. Here we find another silver dress. Looks like we can give some to companions. And if we head to the dresser to the northwest, we find a shroud outfit. The shroud outfit is a reskinned version of the silver shroud costume, but it's very similar to the original. The changes are minimal. The original silver shroud costume had a silver scarf and a silver collar with black pants. This version has silver pants with a black collar and a red scarf. It comes with 15 ballistic and 15 energy resistance, but like the silver dress, it can be imbued with ballistic weave. The door to the north of the master suite leads to a master bathroom. Heading out, we can go down the main staircase to explore a few final rooms. With the western side of the manor explored, we'll turn east. This leads to the formal dining room. We see a big table with silver plates and cutlery on display, of course. And opening the door to the north leads to a hallway. To the east, we find a door that leads downstairs to a kitchen level. We find a few containers, lots of pre-war boxed foods on display, and a few items in the fridge. Opening a door to the east leads to the small laundry room. Heading out of the kitchen and laundry room, we can go north down the hallway. To the right is the guest bathroom. Next to this is a guest bedroom. This is probably where Candy and Trevisani's thugs slept. Heading out and turning north, we find a back door leading outside. This puts us out into a ruined former parking lot right next to the Cambridge Police Station. We see a large Nuka-Cola billboard embedded in a big pile of broken bricks. Heading back inside the manor, we can turn west, and this brings us back to the smoking lounge with the staircase to the top floor. So we've done a big loop and explored everything in this house, including every secret passage. The Shroud Manor creation also adds many of the new pieces of reskinned furniture that we find inside Shroud Manor to our settlement build menu. However, at the moment, there isn't a unique Shroud Manor Creation Club category, so we kind of have to go through everything to try and find what's new. Of note, there are the reskinned chairs, glossy white, glossy black, and then a variety of gray chairs and couches. There are a couple of lamps. Both of them are gray. One has musical notes on the lampshade, and the other has gray stripes. However, I couldn't find them in the build menu. I looked under electricity and in decorations everywhere I thought I could be, but I didn't see them. 
There are some new paintings, a silver shroud painting, and then two castle paintings. There are lots of silver shroud themed posters in the manor, but I couldn't find these in the build menu either. I looked under wall decorations, I checked in paintings, posters, lighted posters. I'm just not sure why they weren't available to build. We can also craft the bookcase hidden doors, but only at Shroud Manor. When I tried looking for these again back at Kingsport Lighthouse, they weren't there. So I guess that means we can only build these at the manor. And that is the Shroud Manor update for the Creation Club. So, is it worth it? Well, the value prop for these creations really confuses me because this was the exact same price as the Heavy Incinerator. The Heavy Incinerator creation came with one weapon and a rather short quest. Shroud Manor came with a complete player home, over a dozen new workshop build items, two new reskinned outfits that accept Ballistic Weave, one new reskinned weapon, and a much longer quest and story. In my eyes, we get more bang for our buck here, but maybe that's just because it had more of what I value. It may be that there are many people who just don't care about the settlement build system and really only look for new weapons, which is why they're priced so similarly. The player home we get is fantastic. I actually like where it's located. Having to fight your way home every time is a change of pace. And the interior was beautiful. Lots of room for storing our collectibles. But sadly, we can't send companions here, which is quite a shame. It's a huge place, a perfect amount of room for all of our companions. On one hand, I like the fact that there are so many new reskinned things that fit a Silver Shroud theme, but on the other hand, I'm also kind of bummed that everything new we find is just a reskinned version of something we're familiar with. They were honest about this in their marketing materials. They said that all of these assets were reskinned, but after exploring the Noir apartment, which had brand new furniture items made from scratch and completely original to that creation, I can't help but feel a tad disappointed. But maybe that's reflected in the price. After all, the Noir apartment was 600 credits, and this one's only 400. This creation was a lot of fun. I enjoyed the quest. It did raise some lore issues, and I know I'm being pedantic, most people won't be bothered by them, but finding the Institute furniture and the Institute monitors inside this building was jarring to me, as the technology, culture, and design of the Institute was created in isolation for the past 200 years. Now, I suppose it's possible that the two different types of Institute chairs we find in the manor could have been used by the Commonwealth Institute of Technology before the war, and the Institute just never changed them after the war, and somehow Trevisani got his hands on some and brought them to his manor. Sure, I suppose that's possible. It just seems unlikely. I think it's much more likely that the Institute invented these designs long after the war. But finding the Institute monitors showing off the watcher's cameras is really lore-breaking. Those monitors should only be in the SRB. I understand why they're here. If you don't know the lore behind what was shown on the monitors, they just look like generic monitors. But once you know the lore, that what we're seeing is coming from the camera eyes of synthetic birds spying for the Institute, then seeing it here just doesn't make any sense. The quest was fun, I enjoyed its length, and all of the detail that went into each character. There's a lot to sift through here, and I appreciate that. But the story didn't sit 100% right with me, mainly because here we've got this big crime boss, Trevisani, whom we've never heard of before. This guy has his hands everywhere, has even corrupted some of the police force. He's powerful to the point where in his own terminal he says, I run this city. And yet in Fallout 4, we spend a great deal of time inspecting police terminals, reading the Boston Bugle entries, and none of them even mention Trevisani, and he's supposed to be this big crime boss. In addition, there's another pre-war crime boss named Eddie Winter. Eddie Winter, who is mentioned by the police on their terminals and is often referenced in the Boston Bugle, but Trevisani never mentions him. He mentions some other rival gang family, the Michellis, and Eddie Winter never mentions Trevisani or the Michellis. I think this would have worked a lot better if Trevisani was written as a much smaller mob boss, a guy who was just getting started, maybe had one small district of Boston that he could truly call his own. That would explain why no one from the vanilla game seems to know that he exists. He's just too insignificant. The plot is also kind of similar to the whole Eddie Winter story. 
Both stories involve crime bosses who use their connections to build a safe place. Eddie Winter purposefully makes himself into a ghoul, whereupon we find him 200 years later. Candy accidentally turns into a ghoul, whereupon we find her 200 years later. There are also parts of the story that just never get resolved. For example, in Trevisani's terminal, we find a letter from the Carpenters, and in that letter they say that the billiard room is sagging, and then they offer to fix it for them. But the very next day, they're all killed by Marco, so they wouldn't have had time to fix the billiard room. And yet when we explore the billiard room, it's fine. There's no sagging. What went on there? We don't know. That story was just sort of thrown in there and then abandoned. Then there's also the story of Sergeant Callahan and his tan suit. Candy brings up Sergeant Callahan, the man in the tan suit, as a way to explain why Triggerman attacked us at the Warren Theater. But in doing so, she brings up the possibility that her sergeant in the tan suit is still alive, and he's a ghoul now, and he's still walking around Boston in his tan suit, revisiting old haunts. Yet, as far as I know, we never see this guy. He never showed up to the Warren Theater, he never showed up to the Shroud Manor. Did Candy really see him, or was that just part of her imagination? imagination. We don't know, it's never flushed out. Now, I haven't dug through the code or anything, maybe he was added as a random encounter, and if that's the case, then great. But I wish we had a little bit of closure about the man in the tan suit. There were moments like that in the story that felt a little contrived. They were events that wouldn't really happen. Like, I can't imagine Sergeant Callahan being so nostalgic about a woman whom before the war he cared so little for that he practically sent her to her death. That he would dress up in his old pre-war tan suit, put a useless ticket in his pocket, and then visit the Warren Theater every week, 200 years later. Also, Candy suddenly becoming a mob boss was a weird moment in the story. I understand that from her story arc, she felt betrayed by Sergeant Callahan and Lieutenant Mitchell, and perhaps that betrayal caused her to leap into a life of crime. But then she goes on to explain the mechanics of this by saying that she used the house to reconnect with Trevisani's old mob connections, most of whom presumably survived the apocalypse, and instead of becoming raiders, they're continuing their mob business in Boston, a mob business which was successful enough after the apocalypse to allow Candy to continue to live the lifestyle she was accustomed to. I think that's just highly unlikely. After the war, Boston was in chaos, so many people died to the radiation, survival was a struggle. And finally, I don't really understand the premise of Trevisani's mob empire. We're supposed to believe that his love of the Silver Shroud is a cover for his mob business, which, first of all, is weird in and of itself, because the Silver Shroud fought crime, fought against the mob. That's like a Nazi saying, my favorite superhero is Captain America. Then, in his terminal, he goes on to describe his mob business as protection, smuggling, and chems. So we're supposed to believe that he invented a reputation for himself of being this great lover of the Silver Shroud as a way to deflect attention away from his crime business of smuggling chems. I don't see how that works. I get the idea that you can be a crazed fan of this comic book, and your big mansion dedicated to the comic book becomes well known. Okay but you can still be a crime boss and a fan of the Silver Shroud. The way a front is supposed to work is it's supposed to be a business that hides another business. So for example, the mob would have racketeering, gambling, in the basement or the back of a restaurant. That restaurant was their front. Or in the case of L.A. Noir, a haberdashery's is the front from mob boss Mickey Cohen. It had the appearance of being a legitimate business selling clothing and hats to gentlemen, but in the basement, he was doling out drugs. It's easier to confuse the IRS because the funds you get from your crime can be integrated with the funds that you get from your business. But the business we find Trevisani doing here is illegal. He's producing off-brand posters and selling them as fully branded and licensed Hubris Comics merchandise. So he's got an illegal business as a front for his illegal mob activity. What? <laughs> That's good. The dots don't really connect. But overall, I liked it. It's a great player home, it's sprawling, the bookcase doors work flawlessly, and it's a great addition to the Creation Club. But those are just my thoughts. 
I'd like to know yours. Is Shroud Manor the kind of player home you've been looking for? Are you going to move right in? Or is the location just a bit too dangerous for you? Share your thoughts in the comments below. I publish many videos each and every week here on my channel. And if you don't want to miss my next one, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I have a shirt shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos.